Thank you so much for being with us this evening at the library, um, albeit virtually, but as we were saying, um, you'll, you'll come back in person very soon, hopefully. Um, and uh, before I ask my kind of first opening question, I just wanted to introduce you uh, for those who don't know a little bit about your, your background. You're a writer, you're a journalist, you're a former visiting fellow at the American Library in Paris. You're with us in 2016 and the fellowship is generously um, supported by the De Groot Foundation, so thank you to them. You're the author of Birds of a Lesser Paradise from 2012 and Almost Famous Women from 2015, and you've written columns on climate change and the nature and the natural world for the Paris Review and The Guardian, and you won the 2019 Phil Reed Environmental Writing Award in Journalism. Um, to get started, I would like to begin with your two opening quotes. Um, because I, it seems to me uh, that this collection is so expansive in terms of its environment, in terms of its time, that any excuse to find a kind of common uh, through line by way of opening quotes, I think we should, we should consider it. Um, so your first quote is from Emily Dickinson and you cite her and she writes, a wounded deer leaps highest and wounded is in italics. And then you also quote, and this is the quote that I would like to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, this is from Sylvia Plath's Unabridged Journals. And she writes, I don't believe the meek will inherit the earth. They decompose in the bloody soil of war, of business, of art, and they rot into the warm ground under the spring rains. Can you tell us uh, how do these epigraphs help us understand the projects of How Strange a Season? Megan? Yes, thank you for that. And uh, before I get started, I just want to thank you for your time and uh, what I can tell are going to be really thoughtful questions. I want to thank everyone who is online right now and who made time to listen to us uh, discuss the book. I really appreciate that. Um, I know that it's an option, an optional way to use your time. So I'm honored by your presence. Um, also, huge thanks to the DeGroote Foundation who gave me time when I needed it most. So 2016, it was the first time I had been away from my daughters and um, being able to spend a month in Paris. They came to visit two weeks in. I thought I was going to die by about the second week <laughs> being away from them. But other than that feeling, I so cherished having time to myself. It, you know, they were still young. I wasn't sleeping much. Being able to think again, being able to spend time in museums, to peruse the stacks, to be around other writers and readers at the library was such an enormous privilege and so foundational toward getting my writing life back and my intellectual life back. So many thanks to the library, many thanks to the foundation for that. Um, so I want to start there with a huge uh, bout of gratitude. And, and next, I love that you noticed um, those upfront quotes. You know, I, I always tell my students at Middlebury that we have so many small opportunities to create meaning for readers, to give them things to mine the book for, to carry with them as they read. And I think titles, even the cover, you know, there, there's so many small things that we can offer that deepen a book's experience. And so I think really hard about these. The Dickinson one I wanted to get exactly right. So I asked my friend Dan Chasen, the poetry critic for The New Yorker, you know, how exactly did Dickinson write this? And he was the one that gave me the very precise <laughs> italics. I didn't want to offend any Dickinson scholars. Um, and, and the idea of the wounded deer leaps highest. I think my ambition as a writer is to be psychologically astute. I want to think about what actually motivates humans as they, they work and they live and they make mistakes and they fall in love and they have, you know, carve out their lives. And I think a lot of us react and forge ourselves um, on pain. And so this idea of a wounded deer leaping highest, I think that sometimes that's, that's the motivation, that, that pain that we carry, that we're trying to understand or trying to transcend. Um, and I think my characters carry a bit of that. I know that I do. I can't speak for anyone else and I, I don't profess to understand the, the human condition, <laughs> but um, that's, that's my intention with that quote. And then Sylvia Plath's, um, you know, thoughts on the meek, <laughs> not inheriting the earth. You know, I, I wrote this book at a time in my life where I felt deeply frustrated by the patriarchy. And I'm sure that's, you know, pretty clear <laughs> to, to anyone who, who read. Um, and 
I have a sensitive nature and I'm one of those people and, I, and a lot of writers and artists that I've met are wired that way with a deep sensitivity and a deep love for others and and the world around them and and sometimes it can be hard to go through life as a sensitive soul and so I've had to teach myself over time to be to honor the the more ferocious side of my nature in order to get things done and and I'm constantly battling that like my my sensitive side and my more ferocious side and this quote also speaks to climate change for me just in terms of environmental degradation and who will bear the cost of it so I think I also had that in mind when I selected it. Thank you Megan. Um, you mentioned also that uh, titles are important so tell us uh, what does House Stranger Season set up in terms of um, the stakes of this collection? Yeah titles are, are so tricky and so important. And I mean, I, I wish you guys could see, you know, the the weeks of sleepless nights, you know, where you, you settle on three possible titles and you turn them over and over and over. Can you, you tell know, us, can you tell us the other two? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it had many, it had more than two. I think it probably had at least uh, five working titles, but um, at first, you know, I, I went with the novella title, Indigo Run. Mm because it is a really place-based book, but I thought that was a little too myopic in terms of, you know, the, the novella is a big part of the book, but it, it doesn't get at everything. What I wanted to come across to readers was that there could be a strange, you know, collision of beauty and horror, um, that we are in unprecedented times, but I didn't want the book to feel like a hot take where climate change is the plot point because I feel like it's more than that. You know, it's not if it will happen, it's happening. So for me, I, I didn't want that, oh, climate change to be a, you know, a, you know, a, just a, a twist in the book. I wanted it to already exist and to be applying pressure on the stories and the characters themselves because I think that honors the impact of it. I feel like as, um, a society we've underestimated the existential and spiritual cost of of this changing world so I wanted that bizarre quality to come forth and when I saw the canvas um, Georgia O'Keeffe's painting that's on the cover of the book with the pink moon over the emerald seas it captured that feeling for me perfectly where it was beautiful but it was weirded it was strange it was bizarre um, and I find climate change to be a really visual medium and a visually compelling medium so I liked the collision of that with the title and the image and the title that I chose How Strange a Season is from an Italian poem so the words actually came in translation um, Patricia Cavalli uh, wrote a poem where one of the lines is How Strange a Season and um, I happened to be reading that collected book when when I was searching for titles and it it grabbed me you know, I, I think two things I think I think makes me think, first of all, of Elizabeth Colbert's new book, Under a White Sky. You know, there's, there is a lot of attention, I think, in the age of the Anthropocene to um, the way nature and natural colours are warped in, as you say, visual and, and interesting ways. Um, and I want to pick up on your point, Megan, about climate change, not as a hot take, but as a um, as a backdrop in, in some sense, because it gets to a question that I have for you, which is, um, it's, it's the crucial background to the collection is the climate crisis. This is, this is a, a topic that, as I mentioned from your biography, you've covered a lot. And I wanted to quote um, uh, this journalist, David Roberts uh, from 2013. What I'm really quoting <laughs> is another book. Um, so this is Jennifer Wenzel's The Disposition of Nature, and she cites him in her introduction. And he writes, climate change is the kind of change that changes everything. It affects everything that rests on that substrate of modern civilization, agriculture, land use, transportation, energy, politics, behavior, everything. Climate change is not a story, but a background condition for all future stories. In other words, climate change is fundamental to narrative. Uh, and to life. And we see this over the course of the collection from large scale plant installations in the first story um, workhorse to watching water usage in, in, in heirloom to um, the apparently delicious invasive species in lionfish. Can you speak um, just more deeply here about climate change and climate crisis as a backdrop, as you say, condition and, and how uh, to use it in such as how, how are you able to use it in such a specific way and, and so that it doesn't become precisely a hot take or a political point that you're trying to make? 
Yeah, I love, I love that question. I love the quote you used. It really speaks to the interconnectedness and pervasiveness that um, I feel like I wake up thinking about almost every day. Uh, I think for those of us who've been studying it, and I would say plenty of us who've been living it, you know, on, on the front lines where, you know, this, the knife is already starting to twist in ways that can't be ignored, such as on the coast or in California where wildfires are happening. I mean, there's, it's, I guess when I think about what short fiction can do or novels can do, it is metabolizing these things that are weighing on our collective consciousness that are affecting us spiritually and emotionally. Um, I think one of my professors at Bennington used to talk about when you sit down to write something, think about how can you write this poorly? <laughs> and I think when, when we come to the page with our social consciousness, our, our social issues, our environmental issues, there's a way to write them that feels like a frying pan up here where it feels like you're gonna bludgeon someone with righteousness or scientific jargon. And I don't think a reader wants to stay for that. I don't think a reader wants to receive that. I think what a reader might be more interested in is how does this affect us spiritually and emotionally? How is this pressurizing our daily lives? Um, what is the sensory experience of being in it and so when I think about ambitions for the stories and my creative work, I wanna be able to offer that instead of anything that feels heavy handed with expertise. Although I will say being an environmental journalist and having a lot of field work over the last 10 years has given me so much in a way where I can think about what Hemingway called the iceberg theory, where you have you know, a giant hulking iceberg and you have a water line and you have this tip, and this might be what the reader sees on the page, but the writer needs to know so much more, um, you know, even if it's not actively making its way onto the page in words. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like scientific knowledge, climate knowledge, climate awareness, any sort of expertise a writer develops can bear down in sort of subconscious and lyrical and atmospheric ways without having to be heavy handed with righteousness or technical details. And so that's sort of how I'm trying to think about bringing it to the creative work. It's so interesting, Megan, that you um, cite sh the, the form of the short story and the form of the novel as conducive to uh, tackling this issue because it has been, it's been criticized. I'm thinking of Amitav Ghosh and his long essay, The Great Arrangement. He's, he's criticized the very form of the novel itself. Um, I guess, particularly the 20th, 19th, 20th, 21st century form of it. Um, as if that was not a form before, but still, um, uh, as as unable to accommodate the issue. Do you do you do you ever have this sense? I mean, I I feel like as humans, as policymakers, as artists, as um, caregivers, I feel like all of us are falling short of where we could be in terms of reckoning with the climate crisis and environmental degradation. So I I I can't think of a form or a vocation where I think, you know what, they're nailing it, <laughs> good. Exactly. Um, we've we've yeah, solved I, it now. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, yeah. I hear a lot of interesting, uh, you know, talk. Among, I was just on a, a panel with Nathaniel Rich, who's a, a climate writer. Um, he does fiction and nonfiction, probably um, most read, you know, with his pieces in the New York Times. But we were talking about kind of optimism versus pessimism, dystopian versions versus utopian versions. I think what, where we started with kind of integrating climate awareness into fiction was the dystopias. There seems to be, and, and I'm not a writer or a reader of them necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but I'm fascinated about what, you know, what, what can be accomplished. I, I am not great at signing up for experiences of misery and sadness. So, I mean, even with nonfiction, it's hard for me to opt into awareness and opt into information. So when it comes to what art can do or what fiction can do, I think I am looking for something that feels like insight and not, not righteousness or stating the obvious um, or a hot take, you know what? I run an environmental writing conference and I read, I read the slush pile a lot. Um, and I've, I've been teaching for 12 years. And, you know, I, so I've seen the kind of quick take that, you know, a lot of us wanna write the climate change makes me sad piece, or, you know, I think there's beauty in the specificity when we can go down a couple layers into particular human experiences or landscape experiences 
um, I think that there's more to offer there. Yeah, so this is great. So let's talk about the particular human experiences and specifically landscape experiences, because um, what is what is I think so so you so deftly guide your reader through not only a series of environmental landscapes but also temporal landscapes. So we move from a glass house um, on the rainy west coast to an underground bunker in I'm quoting you sickeningly hot Arizona to sleepy olive groves under the strong sun of Sardinia, uh, and similarly. Um, from New York City in 2010 to a lakeside uh, mansion in the Adirondacks in 1988 to vignettes from the Deep South um, in 1954. Can you talk about the, the very particular choices that you've made in terms of not only physical setting but also temporal setting um, that shape the, the collection and the stories in it? Yes, I think with this one it was important to me for it to feel well-rounded and holistically landscape-wise to show the ways that this is pressing down on us everywhere um, and that it will continue to do so. So some of the the pieces, I think like the one set in California are a little bit futuristic, not, not greatly so, maybe a handful of years. I think when I engage in just day-to-day -day conversations about the climate crisis, I, I notice our collective inability to reckon with the fact that it is here, that changes are imminent, that, you know, that scientists are forecasting like hurricane scales will have to be increased in order to accommodate stronger storms you know what so letting landscapes like a waterless ranch in Arizona or a house a, a glass modernist house about to slide off you know a cliff in California um, just trying to step into loss and grief and precarious scenarios um, but to do so at a really specific human level where we can feel the characters, you know, emoting and digesting, you know, those stakes. So do the, do the characters come first or does, the, does this, the landscape and the situation come first because I imagine it varies? That's a great question. And I, I, I almost paused for a moment because I, every now and then I've gotten the critique that I might care about my landscapes ah! <laughs> because I, I, I do, I love an atmospheric quality to anything. I mean, I, I've said this before, but I think often as a writer, and, and I could say something more elegant um, and academic right now, but I, I think as readers and writers, some of us are still trying to get back to that first moment where we fell in love with reading and writing and we felt transported. And unfortunately for me, or fortunately, that is like a yellow hardback Nancy Drew novel. Like I love, <laughs> I love a crumbling mansion <laughs> and I love some Spanish moss in the trees. And um, sometimes I'm trying to write something that has a little whiff of intrigue and mystery to me, a place where I'd like to spend time, um, even visually or within my imagination. So, you know, I can definitely say, I can't say it's true for all of the stories, but for many of them, the landscape comes first and then it populates in my imagination. So for the novella Indigo Run, I can point to the very curve in the Ashley River where I've stood. Um, and then the, the novella came. So it's an astute question. And, um, you know, I think story and character do ultimately in a process have to come forward um, for a reader to, to feel the emotional heart of the story. In most cases, I won't say all, but landscape is huge for me, absolutely huge. Yeah, it's so clear. And I think it touches on, you know, this dichotomy between horror and beauty. And I think so much of the beauty in this collection is your description and your sensitivity to to the backdrop. Um, uh, before we move on, <laughs> as if we can escape it, but as, uh, before we move on kind of thematically from the climate crisis, I wanna just touch on one more important point, which is um, environmental justice or injustice. Um, so kind of departing from this idea um, that the scholar who we were talking about before, the call um, Rob Nixon's idea of slow violence and this idea that um, vulnerability to environmental harm is unevenly universal or as a protagonist uh, your protagonist in a taste for lionfish puts it risk is relative what we see in your stories and particularly in a taste for lionfish um, is that different characters and and, and different places are affected um, unevenly although we're all being affected and I, I wanted to kind of quote um, one of your characters Ward who had the kind of culmination of the short story actually gets quite angry um, at the protagonist who's 
essentially trying to sell him um, and sell the community uh, this invasive linefish. But, um, but, and the idea is to eliminate the invasive linefish by convincing locals to start eating them. And so this is, I wanted to quote two points um, of Ward kind of re um, replying, let's say, to the, to the protagonist. And he says <clears throat> of her work, I think it's uh -huh. um, It's not honorable work, he said, his face suddenly growing serious. You're out there trying to tell someone else how to live. You're trying to tell these poor folks how to fix a rich folks problem. And then um, two pages later, he says, which is why you have to uh, do better than you're doing. You can't go around telling people how to solve your problems. You solve them. You get in this goddamn motion with a spear and catch the invasive fish. You clean up the reef. You get down on your hands and knees and do the fucking work. Work. You suffer for once. And then the end of the short story, the real kind of kicker is the protagonist says, I never ate lionfish myself. Um, can you speak a little bit, um, Megan, about I suppose, kind of insider outsider um, perspective here on on the climate crisis and how you yourself feel as as a writer and artist coming into this very messy um, milieu, um, but with real concern and, and real love and real sensitivity, as you say. Yes, thank you for picking up on that. It's um, I think the climate crisis can sometimes trigger a savior complex in a lot of us, um, and I guess taking a step back. So the more I read, the more I'm out there in the field and researching and writing pieces, the more I, I can't help but see the climate crisis connected to issues of capitalism and labor. Um, you know, I think someone born in Bangladesh, you know, mm -hmm. or it's, it's, I think the stat is that someone in America has a carbon footprint that's 12 times that of a child born in Bangladesh. You know, like we know that based on consumption patterns, you know, carbon, you know, impact, environmental impact is not is not the same. And we also know that, you know, those living on the margins um, will will bear an outsized impact. Uh, and they already have in many ways. So I think, um, I, you know, it's hard to replicate some of these concerns and these issues in fiction without feeling heavy handed. And this story is sort of an attempt at how, how can we explore this book grounded in scene and grounded in place and so the character does have a, a bit of a savior complex, wants to be one of the good guys, wants to feel like we're a part of something. Um, I remember when I was on a research trip in um, the, the conflict zone of Northern Kenya and the person I was with, a brilliant woman named Kathleen Colson was pointing out these solar ovens that a well-intentioned white person had you know, come to Kenya and said, here, we can solve your problems, use this solar oven. But it wasn't a community-led initiative, and so they were just lying around unused um, and and sort of an eyesore. And this is sort of paternalistic notion of like, here I can teach you to fix this, or I can teach you to do this better, or you know, my my economic class made these problems, and now we're going to ask you to help us clean them up, or you know, engage you in this. And I think this is is rampant. And whenever we have disaster, we're going to have opportunism. So capitalism is going to rush in to fill those those spaces and those opportunities, um, you know, which I think will further unequal wealth creation if we don't have our eyes on it. So, you know, I'm thinking about all these sort of big picture issues, but if you, you know, bring that to the page, it's boring and wonky and, and stilted. And so, you know, trying to take it down to something that feels more human and emotional and something that I honestly can relate mm -hmm. to. I get so annoyed with myself when I feel like, I am talking or creating content more than I'm actually doing. And I think when, uh, when I feel that, you know, I, I challenge myself to, and I apologize if this sounds self-righteous, I drive a Meals on Wheels route, or, you know, I try to do something philanthropic, just forgetting there actually is so much we can do. We don't have to just spout off on Twitter or write fiction or feel like we are on this path to glory in some way, intellectual glory, whatever, that, that doing still counts so much. So there's some of that frustration with myself there's some self-loathing in this story in that way yeah i mean i think anyone who is concerned for the environment feels frustrated by just simply living in in the world in which we do because by the fact of living in it you're constantly basically being a hypocrite i mean there's no there's no way around it um so i i, I guess <laughs> um on that particular note um the system and this i think is another kind of key backdrop key um, 
point of understanding uh, for, for the collection is, is neoliberalism and its logic. Um, I think this is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but essentially it's the idea, um, and we see this so clearly kind of in your characters and in their relationships, that economic growth and competition are the defining, um, not in all of the stories, but particularly in some of them, um, defining characteristics of human relations. And so citizens are recast as consumers and their democratic choices are best exercised by buying and selling, um, which rewards merit and punishes uh, inefficiency. So we see this, this kind of neoliberalist logic play out, particularly in what I'm thinking in Wife Days and, and the heirloom. So in Wife Days, um, your protagonist Farah uh, has, I'm quoting you, has always been a strong believer in supply and demand. Too much supply and the demand goes away, she thinks. Novelty is important. Give your husband, in this case, Blake, too much sex and he'll get bored. Um, and then this kind of, this, this idea of, of, I think neoliberalism even invades um, her hobby, which is open water swimming. And while she's swimming, she thinks pull harder, work smarter. Uh, and again, we, we find these kind of characters, uh, neoliberalist characters in the, in the heirloom with um, basic rich men and uh, this idea of the transactional mentality and the hedge fund guys. Can you speak to um, essentially the backdrop of neoliberalism? Um, and is it, is it American neoliberalism or is it just neoliberalism more broadly? I love that you picked up on, um, you know, the sort of the like the things that I didn't know if other people would see, you know, that, that you would like build into creative work. Um, I was thinking so much about labor and power, um, supply, demand, how those who are powerless will, you know, the ways that we will try to wield power when we are restricted in some way. Um, there, there's so much of that functioning throughout. I think one thing that started, that was really on my mind as I was writing this, and I don't, I, I think it has its genesis in American culture, Western culture for sure, but the rise of um, caring for the individual, like radicalized self-care or just, re, or the hustle, you know, thinking about self-actualization first and at all cost. And I think there's some beauty and wisdom in that, like a lot of things, but when taken too far, it starts to feel analogous to rugged individualism from the Bush era, the sense of like self first, take care of the self first um, and, and glamorizing that and valorizing that. And I think there's a different mentality that's possible, which is, you know, how to think about community or the system and not constantly putting self actualization first or, um, prosperity first. So I think I think you picked out the stories where I did have that in mind. And I will also say in Indigo Run, it's in mind um, in terms of land ownership, um, the ability to create wealth for oneself. You know, not, not everyone is given that ability equally. So um, that sort of power dynamic and wealth creation um, is a, a thread throughout. I feel like it's something I've, I've, I've struggled with myself. I mean, usually if I'm putting these issues into my work, it's something I'm, I'm struggling with on a personal level or thinking about on a personal level. And so I don't mean to pretend that I have it all figured out or that I am walking a high road. Uh, it's sort of the, the Rilke idea of being in love with the question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess the reason I wanted to um, query if it was an American neoliberalism is because what struck me in the in the first um, short story workhorse is that uh, you have the protagonist's father leave and and kind of live out his retirement dream in Sardinia, and uh, he calls his daughter basically saying, you know, you're an American capitalist, and she says, my work doesn't revolve around profit. Um, when you were here in in Paris for your residency, and I'm. You, we were talking before about you've traveled in Europe before. Does, does it seem less kind of capitalistic and neoliberal when you were over here? That is a great question. I feel slightly underqualified <laughs> to, to answer it. Um, I do. Maybe, I, there, Vermont, maybe let's say Vermont versus New York City when you, or when you go into cities. I, I do appreciate Vermont's humility. Um, there is less of a rush here to to own there's even like a self-consciousness of like if you are dressed too well or your car is too clean <laughs> you know there, there's um a sort of conspicuous nature that that feels problematic um here and that is problematic for sure 
at heart. Um, I love that you went back to workhorse because there's a paragraph in that story where I talk about the father idealizing Jack Welch, this sort of um, 80s, 90s CEO, um, you know, iconography, this, this like what prosperity and success, I guess it's for me, it's about the definition of personal prosperity and success being problematic. And it was what I was raised on. So I think I had a period of, of time in my life where I thought this is what success looks like. Um, and, and so having a character proceed bullishly with his life for so long, and then, you know, at the end of the story, having this moment of awareness and grief. Um, and a lot of characters in these stories are, I think, thinking about redemption, even maybe the impossibility of, of redemption. And that's probably my Southern Gothic streak coming out. Um, but I think there's, um, there's the other side to it there. Can you, um, you mentioned, you mentioned quite a lot at the beginning, and I just wanted to pick you up on it before we um, continue. I just have a few more questions. And if you, if you have a, to post a question or a comment for Megan, please go ahead and do it um, so that I can start to integrate them into our conversation. Um, Megan, you mentioned spirituality a lot at the beginning, and now you've mentioned um, your, your Southern background. And I read an essay, um, come away, you published it, I think it was in, on, on Literary Hub about um, the relationship between science and spirituality and, and you describe quite personally having lost your kind of traditional um, faith. Where does <clears throat> spirituality uh, kind of fall for you today and what form of spirituality does that take? And, and where does it possibly find your, its way into your fiction? I love, I love that question. I think it's a running conversation with myself. Um, that I will probably, or at least as I told my daughter, you'll be asking yourself this question for the rest of your life. And I, I think most of us do in some way. Um, it's slippery and I don't know that, and I, and I actually would be suspicious of certitude, you know, on my part or, or anyone else's, which I think was one of the, my early problems with, you know, any, any sort of like formal prescribed religion, um, which is, is what I grew up on. Um, I'm, I'm wired for spirituality. I love it. I miss, I miss the place where it was. Um, and I'm sort of naturally reverent. And I've, I've found that the thing that does that for me, which I think a lot of people found even during the pandemic possibly is solace in nature. And the one thing that has gripped me with the power of like old fire and brimstone scripture as a, a secular person is Frank Lloyd Wright's comments on, you know, believing in God, but spelling it nature and, and his own sort of reverence in that capacity and, and what it does for the human spirit to be integrated with nature. And so for me, that's, that's where I always fall. And I think in terms of the collection and creativity and environmentalism, just to go back to that point, I think I think this will have a huge spiritual toll on us. This this feeling of human guilt of um, you know, like you mentioned Colbert's you know book about under the white sky. I mean, the, the spiritual tax of looking at nothing but a white sky would will affect us. And it, I watch it affecting my children. Just being able to you know, my daughter who's ten was walking in the backfield with me a couple of months ago and just said spontaneously. I didn't realize it was going to get this bad this soon. And, and when you realize the existential weight of environmental degradation on your 10 year old shoulders, you think that, that level of confusion and chaos and hopelessness about the future is not healthy for anyone's spirit, not our spirit, not their spirit. Um, so it's a lot to process intellectually and artistically, I think. Yeah. Thank you, um, that lovely response. Um, I think that in some way it, it, it highlights <clears throat> something that we haven't really talked about, but I would like to, and you mentioned right at the beginning that in part um, this collection was born out of rage <laughs> against the patriarchy. Um, and indeed, uh, most of your characters are women and, and they're relating in, in, in kind of in various uh, relation, relational roles. So we have daughters to fathers, wives to husbands, granddaughters to dead grandmothers, uh, sister to her family. Um, can you talk about what unites uh, your female characters and what is particular to female relationships, which is a very, very strong through line through this collection? It is. I mean, you, you, you nailed it. It was born of rage. I think my own personal 
rage, you know, from, from childhood on, but also the Trump era for me, um, I hate even saying that name, catalyzed a lot of these feelings. There were things where I think growing up in the 90s and even early 2000s, there was a false sense of girl power or that we had somehow overcome you know, issues around labor and equity um, in the home, outside of the home, um, bodily autonomy. And to, but I think always that sneaking suspicion that we hadn't and the pain in that, you know, that, that dissonance between, you know, taglines and what people are saying and then what, you know, a, a, a woman or woman identifying, you know, person's experience in the world, what that actually feels like and the casual sexism um, that abounds I also think I, uh, you know, I think when you get a little older, there's also the the moment of like, you realize, or for me, I, I will speak to my own experience of like, I, I stopped idealizing um, romantic love. I started noticing the messages that my daughters were absorbing about the one or, you know, something that would be in, in a song or a movie and just thinking, oh, it's pervasive. Oh, it's disgusting. <laughs> how, how do we talk about agency? and power and clarity, just clarity. And so, yeah, all, all those, that, that I just described a big, messy, chaotic stew of rage to you, but, you know, with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of inputs. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I do think the, the Trump era, you know, had that extra spark that, you know, I think a lot of women just said, I've had it, I've absolutely had it. I won't pretend, I won't behave, I won't be polite and accommodating, and, and I was, I like being polite and accommodating. <laughs> you know, and I was I was raised in the South where that's a part of, um, you know, not for everyone, but for many of like being being pleasant, proceeding through a situation with grace, minding your manners, minding your elders. Um, and I, I've had to do a lot of work to kind of tease that default setting out of me to be comfortable with being unliked, to be comfortable with being, you know, speaking up. None of that comes naturally to me. I've had to really grind to develop that capacity in myself and to, parent in a way where I hope my girls will have it organically mm. or more so mm. but yeah all, all of all of that stewing and that the underneath the waterline part of um of the collection yeah and, and it culminates of course in your in your final story which is my was my favorite story the night hag and I wanted to read some of it Megan because it, it's it highlights I think and we've had tastes of your of your writing throughout this the, the discussion but I think it, it's it just highlights your your prowess as a writer and it's 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 so beautiful and so haunting um, and I think it it strikes a balance of beauty and horror perfectly um, so I wanted to read the beginning of it and then ask a question then also read the end so you write cousin of Eeg the hag, the hag was born not from a rib but from a fish egg in a stream that cut through a verdant coastal forest jumping here the hag could see now the stories she had been fed all of her learned incompetence her false innocence when she smelt it on other women her stomach turned never believed the stories she whispered to them jumping again she let herself fall into a rage rolling around in her old skin as if it were on fire and then she decided to take it off for good to walk around in the storm as she really was blood muscle and memory. So there are a few questions I had here. First is, and you, you touched on some of these um, kind of romantic stories that women have been fed, but what are some of the other um, narratives that she's whispering for women to not believe that you're undoing here in the final story? Yeah, um, I think it's the, it's a really good question. You know, the first time I read this out loud, I've only read it out loud once when I first wrote it years ago before the, the book had even taken its full shape and I cried. <laughs> and I feel like crying at your own work is like laughing at your own joke, it's just not done. Um, and, and, I, and I almost feel it when you're reading it because it's written from a very, a very personal place. But I think it's this old narrative about a woman's value or all the things that are unsaid about the tax of womanhood um, or at least historic womanhood. I do feel like people are making big leaps in equity, but, but perhaps not big enough. Um, for me, I also felt like childbirth and child rearing were kind of kept a, a little bit of a secret to me in terms of what it would really be like, what is, what is given up, what is placed on pause. 
And I know that's a, a different scenario for everyone, depending on their levels of support and resources and, and goals and mental setting. But um, I think as I, you know, when I was in my late 30s, early 40s, I started to think, um, I just I just felt sort of sick about all I had believed um, about the way the world worked and how uh, I, I was I was naturally set to please and support others. And and I, I'm torn because I think that's a really noble mindset. It's a really beautiful thing. And it also has an extremely high cost. So there are places in the book, some some places in Indigo Run and some places in Workhorse where the female character says, I'm angry that I'm wired this way. I'm angry that I've done these things. And yet, you know, there's a little bit of a dot, dot, dot to honor the complexity, which I feel. And this rage, um, so so you're right, she let herself fall into a rage rolling around in her old skin as if it were on fire. And then she decided to take it off for good. Do you feel, Megan, that in some ways um, writing is a way of, of trying on different skins, taking off old skins, putting on new skins? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I know it because sometimes people in town, the small town where I live, will say, you don't look like the woman who writes those books. <laughs> I'll say, thanks, I think. Um, but I think that was one reason that I became a writer, and my therapist would agree with this, is that you know, when there's dissonance between how you are and the inside of your mind, maybe it's suppressed rage or creativity or intellectual, you know, sides and the and your outward presence when there's dissonance, and I would say there's probably dissonance for, for everyone in some ways, it can be sort of antagonizing, but um, I saw a bumper sticker once and it said, ask me about my rich inner life, and <laughs> it just really resonated with me, but I think for a lot of writers and sensitive folks and imaginative people, sometimes when you can't have the kind of rewarding interactions or, you know, a lot transpires internally. Um, or when you feel narrative distance from maybe places where you were brought up um, or, or a community you're involved in and you feel like you were observing instead of participating, which is a quality I felt a lot, which I think may be the human condition. It may also be being a sensitive introvert. I don't, I haven't quite nailed that. I don't know. But I, I know that I had that observational distance, which I think transforms into a narrative voice sometimes that sort of talking to oneself or chewing on something in a in a narrative way that then starts to kind of come out on the page so i'm much braver in the written word than i am in person and i've been trying to close down that distance for the last 10 years mm -hmm. and just the rage I, I think rage is such a is such a big one and it it takes on so many different tenors in the collection how is the rage that we see in the culminating story the night hag different from, let's say, the rage that we see in a story like Heirloom. Right. I think the, you're right that Heirloom, you know, while it's connected to kind of sexism and frustration and environmental pressure, it's a very immediate, hot-tempered sort of rage of, of just immediate frustration and dissatisfaction and letting it rip. Um, I feel like with the Night Hag and the End of Indigo Run, it's almost something primal and ancient, um, and deeper and systemic. Um, I, do you have, maybe you would like to read the end of Night Hag. <laughs> I, I was going to read it, but maybe, do you have a copy of the, of the book? I do. I would love to hear you um, read the end. So maybe you could start with, uh, she heard their stories and just read to the, read to the end. Sure, I don't get my game face on, so I don't, don't cry. Um, yeah, exactly, I'll cry. I'll cry. <laughs> okay, cry. I'll read. Uh, she heard their stories. The men who thought she was nothing but a great destroyer of lives. But they did not know of her compassion. They did not know of the night she had come to the aid of the Catawba woman whose child was boiled alive by white settlers. The colonist's wife tied to a tree and raped by a soldier. The washerwoman whose daughter had been sold. The women who had been beaten and the women who beat themselves drank themselves to death, traded their bodies. The hag had come to them and put them on her back and carried them on her scaly legs to the water to find peace or die. You could fall to your knees and rake this earth with your fingers and hear it scream, she told them. The suffering here runs so deep. Tired of compromise, the women in their afterlives clung to one another in the boughs of the last ancient trees, slept in the astral light, read books. Many of them had helped cause pain, and now they needed to heal it. Invisible, they rested until they were strong again. 
They walked between the burning crosses left on lawns and blew them out like candles. She showed them how exhausting and beautiful rage could be and how immortal. Thank you, Megan. It's so lovely and such a lovely way to end. Um, you're kind of like predicting your own immortality here through this through this wonderful collection. Um, so uh, if, if anyone has any questions, we, we had a comment from Connie. Um, um, I just also wanted to acknowledge the international uh, makeup of tonight's audience who people are tuning in from Paris, New York, Brooklyn, the French Alps, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Middlebury, uh, Richmond, Vermont, uh, St. Simmons Island in Georgia, another one from Vermont, Jerusalem, Oxford, Toronto, um, upstate New York, really exciting to have all of you on one call. So thank you for being so internationally glamorous. Um, Connie, uh, this is a comment, but I think it, it, it can maybe touch on, on another discussion that you had in the book about the kind of words that are reserved for women. So she writes, our culture is words such as angry, bossy, hysterical, and you, um, at, at some point you talk about the C word. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think about the ways women's more potent feelings have been managed in the past, you know, hysteria and craziness being one, um, you know, up until the 70s, and I tell my daughters this, like, you know, spousal rape was legal, women couldn't buy credit cards, you know, of their own, you know, the, these sort of senses of like, really, this is um, just all the the means, either through language, through through rules, where, you know, female agency, female rage, stifled. And the, the, the C word, the crazy word, um, is one that particularly grates on me just because, you know, so often women were shuttled off to an asylum or, or someplace um, when they became uh, unruly or difficult or unmanageable. And then when you think about what they were probably having to deal with, um, being unruly and difficult probably made plenty of sense. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Um. Uh, okay, well, I, I mean, I have more questions, so I'm going to keep asking them until <laughs> until I, until, I <laughs> until other people. Um, will you t tell us tell us about Indigo uh, Run, Megan? Just just the idea because it, it, it's at the center of, of the collection. It's the novella. Uh, you 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 start you set it in um, simultaneously in, in 1752 and 1954. You introduce it with with another epigraph. Women must destroy in themselves the desire to be loved. Just tell us a little bit about this this story um, and how it relates as a kind of centerpiece to all of the other stories. I love that that you mentioned the epigraph. Um, they're very they're very important. I mean, you know, they're not kind of falling out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love I love that you noticed it, and I love that my my publisher was so accommodating with with my love of epigraphs. I mean, I, I have a wonderful team around me that lets me uh, do things like that. But um, yeah, yeah the, the Mina Loy quote um, about women must destroy, uh, you know, the desire to be loved. When I think about animating forces or drives, the desire to be loved, the desire to be accepted, the way that leads us into to so many problems um, and and heartache. I say that from you know deep personal experience. <laughs> as well. Um, and, and so I wanted this book to be about, you know, it was important to me that it feel deeply complex um, in terms of motivations and characters and choices. Um, because I, I feel that the older I get, the more I realize that every human I meet is, you know, got this bag of grief and post-traumatic stress and illness and loss, you know, that we're, that, you know, and joy and, and, you know, all, all of that all together that we're sort of dragging behind us the older we get. Um, and how to honor that in a story. But I also wanted to talk about the layers of history in a landscape. The, the thing that I love about the South so, so much, although it's obviously a really loaded place sometimes where you have the extreme beauty of the natural world, you know, grading up against extreme social cruelty and disaster. Um, and that rub has existed in some ways early on and then, you know, continued in others. And, and that tension fascinates me in the South. Also the glorification of plantation culture that continues in the South, the way it's still a billion dollar um, industry, hospitality industry, I find to be so um, strange is a gentle word to, to say, you know, why we would um, 
want to, you know, recreate <laughs> in those places of great human suffering or hold them up as icons of beauty? And what, what does it do to our souls to um, treasure problematic things like that, to, to hold them up as beautiful, to revere them? Um, and, and thinking about the sort of poison that puts in, in a human and in a lineage. And my, my mentor, Amy Hempel, when she read this book, she said, how interesting to think about, you know, a Southern home is cursed and not blessed. And, and so I think that's what I was thinking about. Um, I, I, I wonder how it relates to just a larger kind of through line um, in the book of inheritance. Uh, so, you know, you have your the story, the heirloom, you have the story itself, inheritance. Um, how uh, was your thinking about what we inherit individually, collectively, societally uh, shaped as you, as you explored this theme in the collection? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the organizing theme for, for every story and definitely the novel is, you know, we all inherit problematic aspects, you know, of a personality, genetically, a social history, um, a home on a cliff, uh, a plantation home with a dark history, like what, what are, or old traditions that are rooted in, in ugliness, you know, and, and what does it take to break those cycles or to transcend them? Can we transcend them? Is redemption possible? You know, all those, those sort of things. Um, and that, that question, which I won't pretend to have any easy solutions for as usual, but that question really animates the whole spirit of the book. And so it seems like one answer that you point to is rage. Um, uh, and then I, I think maybe another answer, and this is, this is, I'm, this is from, um, I think the same, the same essay, this is searching for the sacred on planet in crisis. Uh, and I wanted to kind of read two quotes because I think that they also point to some kind of <clears throat> solution in the sense that you write, perhaps the planet's failing health calls for new belief systems and spiritual practices that promote harmony and balance with the natural world, you add later. But we know that the ocean is warming and rising birds are missing from the sky, pollinators are dwindling and water is disappearing in places where it was once plentiful. What are those if not cosmic demands for better attention? So apart from rage and apart from um, that kind of beautiful description of women, coming together, acknowledging the pain that they themselves have um, perpetuated and then healing from it. Um, what other kind of, I mean, again, this is a very big question. I'm sure you don't have <laughs> three main answers, but new belief systems, spiritual practices, what do you mean by better attention? I mean, what other kind of um, tangible or practical, even kind of ideological uh, conclusions are you, are you coming to or trying to come to? Yeah, I know. I love I love that question. It's rigorous. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it starts in the place that you acknowledge, which is acknowledging that we've all taken place in these problematic systems, whether it's capitalism or glorifying, you know, the old South or, you know, sexism, what racism, whatever, whatever these parts. And I feel like the last few years, you know, many of us have been taking stock of those and, and, and cultivating, I won't say a perfect awareness by any stretch, but a better awareness of our participation in these systems and how to change these systems. And I'm glad that that is, that is coming. I hope that that idea continues. Um, in terms of thinking about specific things that can be done, one I think is just human exceptionalism is a really problematic belief that many of us carry without questioning that humans have somehow transcended their animal nature and are therefore entitled to the earth's resources. And I think it's ultimately a belief that's at the root of a lot of our capitalistic tendencies and habitat destruction. Um, and so for me, it's thinking about how to, you know, in our own plots of land that we own and the spaces that we can control to be, to make better habitat, to be, you know, you can do that in your own yard. I've written a lot about um, rewilding yards or mowing lists, you know, planting pollinator friendly gardens, but just thinking about habitat for all, you know, being a welcoming neighbor for all, whether that's refugees, whether that's other species, just a general ability to, to give more, to, to question outdated standards, you know, like what a crisp, prosperous lawn looks like. You know, we, we don't have to dump chemicals on our lawn. We don't have to eradicate insects. We don't have to eradicate small mammals living under the garage. We could, we could let them be there. We could, you know, there, there's a whole, kind of mentality shift if we decentered humans that that could change a lot of a lot of things I mean, it's a sort of dramatic far-reaching question but when I think about the heart of it I think it's that 
Yes, it is. It is a little bit, <laughs> a little bit dramatic. <laughs> but what is the end of what is the end of event if not if not dramatic? Um, we have a question from uh, Ellie. It's quite long. I'm just going to read all of it. Um, she, they write. Could you talk a little bit more about that and yet moment or the split between wanting to be strong and wanting to live in service of others, which is uniquely complicated for women, as it relates to the woman slash nature connection. Uh, on the one hand, notions of being close to nature have been used as a tool for oppressing women or dismissing them as irrational or unintellectual or without agency for centuries. And on the other hand, there have been uh, and are incredibly suggestive connections between feminist and environmental movements and nature capital. And nature is clearly such a source of strength and inspiration for you and your work. How do we go about navigating those kinds of problematic narratives? Is there a way to reclaim a woman slash nature connection? It's a great. It is a great question. And Ellie is a particularly great person. She's um, a former <laughs> student of mine, extra brilliant. And you can tell that's coming through. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say this is a question that I think about all the time, I, you know, that I that I don't have easy answers to, that I hope Ellie and I are writing long emails back and forth to each other 10 years from now about. Um, Rebecca Solnit has uh, an essay called When the Hero is the Problem that I think about a lot, um, which is, I, I kind of referenced earlier in my talk, which is this sort of glorification of the individual versus the health of the system. Um, and I have not yet figured out how to fight for what I think is fair for myself or for my daughters um, or for the women I teach. Um, and, and also participate in a very compassionate, nourishing way. I mean, in, in all aspects of my life. I, I find that dance to be one that I'm doing every day. I think the, the main point is to realize that there's so many ways to spend yourself. Um, and I think thinking about doing it intentionally, which Ellie would naturally do to her credit, um, but how, how we spend ourselves. And so there, there are some days where I think I have overspent myself in X direction, um, or my intention is to make sure that I do this. So um, retaining some flexibility, fluidity, and noticing what brings joy, I think, because sometimes serving others does just, you know, bring joy and bring a sort of constructive relief. I don't have it figured out, Ellie. <laughs> You'll do better than I did. 